Welcome to um, Brown Bag Speakers Forum. We're really excited today to have um, our speaker, Dr. Neil Fiore, who also happens to be a member of the Albany Y. And um, I know, I know, that's, that's big. I want to just say um, one thing. Usually at this point, we will tell you what's coming up for the next um, year, the next three, six months. But Paul and I have been procrastinating <laughs> about getting together, and we haven't done that. And then he went on vacation. And so you will hear about that as, as, uh, as that unfolds. Um, I also want to let you know that if there are people here that you know who couldn't come today, this is going to be rebroadcast on KALB, your local Albany Channel 33, on Saturday at 11 and Sunday at 4. And it'll also be up on YouTube, Albany KALB is what you look for. And that'll probably be at the end of the week. So you can look for that. And um, I also want to acknowledge Jack Kenny, who is taping this for us down in the secret um, underground of the, of the library community center. So I, I want to thank him for that. So today's speaker, Dr. Neil Fiore, is the author of six books and CDs, including the best-selling The Now Habit for Over Overcoming Procrastination While Enjoying Guilt-Free Play and The Now Habit at Work. Neil has published in the New York New England Journal of Medicine and has been cited in New York Times, the London Times, and the Wall Street Journal. He's presented several topics at the Smithsonian and for major universities and corporations. He was a paratrooper with 101 Airborne, a manager for Johnson & Johnson, an economic analyst for Shell Oil, and is a founding member of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. He's committed to empowering people and businesses to reach superior levels of performance on the job and to live more fulfilling, satisfying lives. So I'm very excited, and please give a warm welcome to Neil Fiore. Thank you very much. And it's uh, quite an honor to be in my hometown library speaking. So I appreciate that offer and that opportunity. And um, let's just kind of get into it. I mean, what is procrastination? And by the way, we're actually talking about productivity and peak performance and peak productivity, but that doesn't sell as well as procrastination. <laughs> In fact, procrastination, the now habit, the now habit is now in 13 languages. I brought along a copy of it in Chinese and Korean, but it is, it's in lots of different languages. So uh, we can talk about defining procrastination. Um, it's a useful thing to do to get some sense of what we're talking about. Uh, primarily, it's about getting unstuck. So the, the key word that I hear from people who are procrastinating and want coaching or come to see me in therapy, I have an office on Solano Avenue, uh, is I'm stuck. I'm overwhelmed. I'm stuck. There are a number of symptoms you will hear. Uh, I'm stressed. I lack life balance. Do you hear that a lot? feel that a lot. Um, and a key way of getting around that and having, having for over 30 years worked with the issue of procrastination starting at UC Berkeley's Counseling Center, I have heard people say the same things over and over again. I finally decided to write them down and develop the opposite. <laughs> so we have the language of the procrastinators and the language of producers. And my theories have evolved over the years but I now believe that one of the major reasons for procrastination is the way you talk to yourself. All right. And then finally, if you're interested in a little neuropsychology, we can talk, if we get to it, on executive function. That's your human brain located where? Where is it located? It's located in your forehead. The forehead is new. The vertical forehead is new, right? It's the latest brain on the planet. It's the only one that can choose to get a root canal, that can choose to go to college, that can choose to start on your income tax. Right? To choose the animal brain's fear of fire and to face the fire. So one of our ancestors overcame the animal brain fear of fire 
and started the whole process of choice. So if this were an exam, and you were a good, effective student, you'd be writing down certain words, and one of them you'd put little hash marks next to. He used the word choice seven times. That's gonna be on the exam. <laughs> choice. So what is it? Is it laziness? Is it passive aggressive behavior? What do you think? I don't know. I actually don't believe in laziness. I don't believe it. I don't believe human beings are lazy. So, uh, you, do you recall children being so excited about washing dishes, using the vacuum cleaner? They want to participate in everything you do, right? I mean, they're just, we are learning machines and we have a brain that wants to problem solve. If there is procrast, if there is, excuse me, something that looks like laziness or lack of motivation, and I don't believe in lack of motivation either. I don't believe that's true. But these are my theories, what do I know? Uh, is it avoidance, is it a phobia? Well, to speed things up, yes. <laughs> it operates like a phobia. If you were afraid of spiders, you would avoid spiders, right? If, in fact, there was an electric shock connected to your chair at your desk, you would avoid it after one shock. The, the old story of the cat on the stove, right? If it's hot, you run away and you never go near the stove again. Well, if you get burnt, and your definition of being burnt around a particular project you're avoiding, like decision making about what tiles to buy, then uh, you're going to avoid it. So. My definition of procrastination, it is, it operates like a phobia, like someone who's afraid of spiders. You're gonna stay away from it. Whoops. Uh, fear of mistakes and criticism. So people who are indecisive are afraid of making a mistake. But not only that, they're afraid of how much they will beat themselves up and criticize themselves if they make a mistake. And of course, Overwhelm. There's too much to do, I don't know where to start, and then there are people who are optimizers or perfectionists who speak in terms of what's the best thing to do. Well, you've got so many things to do, it really doesn't matter, just get started, right? And if you were taking the exam, you would put down start. This guy talks about getting started even more than he talks about choice. Right, so that word is gonna be on the exam. And is it ADD? Is it dyslexia? Is it ADHD? Well, of course, I come across students and clients who have or been diagnosed with ADD, and my question is, so how do you cope? How do you compensate? All right, I believe I, ha I have certain forms of dyslexia and probably a bit of ADHD, but I compensate, and I have compensated, right? And I would almost say the same thing for mild Alzheimer's or forgetfulness. How do you compensate? How do you work with it? Otherwise, we're only stuck with the diagnosis, but there's no, pro there's no active working on the issue, right? I don't even wanna call it a problem. It's an issue, it's a challenge, Yes, but the diagnosis just locks us up and limits us and becomes an excuse ultimately. Do you agree? You don't have to. <laughs> All right, I just love this cartoon. This is always something else, isn't there? I mean, and there's to-do lists. <laughs> there's getting organized. All these other things I should do, I have to do before I get started. There's always an excuse there'll always be something else. In fact, that's what Hemingway said. If you're writing a book, there'll always be something else. So whether it's <laughs> any, call the mother-in-law, refill, and so on, is so a just great slide. Yeah. And then focusing on done and finish. All right, remember, I'm slimming down your vocabulary. We're getting rid of the term finish and done. I'll explain why they're counterproductive. All right. 
So here's my definition for what it's worth. Procrastination acts like a phobia. You avoid something that you define as dangerous and uncomfortable and probably something that you personally have made uncomfortable and dangerous to your ego, your sense of self, that you've beaten yourself up about it. Now, I don't know why people do that, but I quite often ask my clients, so what would happen if that happened? What would happen if you didn't do that? And it's not unusual to hear, I would make myself miserable. Why would you do that? And you may have heard the story about the Dalai Lama, who a woman raised her hand in San Francisco and said, what about self-hatred? And he turned to the translator and said, what did she say? Now, he's very fluent in English. But he couldn't understand that concept. He says, no, I don't understand that at all. Why would you have self-hatred? We don't have that concept in Tibet. Right? And there are many concepts we have in the English language that do not exist in the Native American languages. Right? All right. Another definition is that, well, you have the symptoms of stress, which means you've threatened yourself as if there were an earthquake. Well, if the task is to sit still and get started on something, like your income tax or your book or your doctoral dissertation, then it doesn't make sense to have a fight-flight response. You don't need to call out the fire department when you're sitting down to do some kind of work. You create anxiety by thinking about the future. So where's the lady with the dun? So the dun thinks about the future. Now, that creates an image of a fictional future the future does not exist. Am I saying something new to you? The past does not exist. There is only now. So when your body tries to get to the future, you have stuck energy. And that's anxiety. That's that shaking in your leg, trying to get to the end of the project, the end of the exam, whatever it is. And it's only when you bring your mind into the present that that stuck energy is released and you have power and productivity. Now, right, that's that little karate shout <sighs> that releases the energy now, right? Athletes know this. Athletes cannot be thinking about the past, about the last play, and they cannot be thinking about the goal or the future. <sighs> they bring their mind into the present. They know where their feet are now. They operate out of chi or in Japanese, Key, as in Aikido, they operate in deep strength inside their body. They bring their mind into the present. So in the present, do you feel the chair on your back? Is it warm? Then you are practicing a kind of mindfulness and your mind is with your body. I'm sure you have things to do in the future, but right now you can release Exhale and float down with a kind of mindfulness. And is the chair holding you? Is the floor holding you? Yeah. You can let go of your striated, consciously controlled muscles. It's pretty easy to be here, isn't it? Except listening to me, of course. <laughs> Psychodynamically, procrastination is like two fists pushing together. You're stuck. Why? Porque, why, like two fists, you're stuck. And if you're stuck like this, it does feel like a lack of motivation, a lack of motor, a lack of movement. You're stuck. Why? Well, you want to go forward, but you can't. You want to go forward, but you can't. Yeah, you can't because yourself doesn't let you. So try out this concept, <laughs> all right? Now this comes from 30 years of experience listening to procrastinators who say in their first sentence, I have to do all of this work, but I don't want to. In one sentence, they have split themselves and their energy into two parts, all right? 
what I call a six-year-old fighting with a two-year-old. <laughs> and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, by the way, rather than procrastination, I'm very lucky to come across Abraham Maslow and his writings. And he said, human nature has been sold short. We humans have a higher nature, which includes the need for meaningful work, for responsibility, for creativeness, for being fair and just, for doing what is worthwhile and preferring to do it well. How does that sound? Yeah? So it's a positive view of, of human nature. But a lot of our beliefs, especially in our culture, are based on negative views of, of human beings, as lazy, as need a carrot and a stick. All right? I often say that if, in fact, you are pushing on the door and it will not open, a Puritan will come by and say, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> or long, you should get up earlier and stay later pushing on that door. Well, what I'm suggesting to you is that perhaps nature has hinged the door so that it will pull open easily. And if you're trying too hard in one direction, you're going in the wrong direction. It's supposed to be easy, which is exactly what my father taught us. Now, my father was an electrician and a handyman, and he taught each of us that if you're turning it and it doesn't move, you're going in the wrong direction. It's supposed to be easy. Now, I did not know how brilliant he was, <laughs> right? We don't appreciate our parents till much later, but that was a brilliant and very different concept. It's supposed to be easy. Procrastination is not your problem, it's your attempted solution. It's a way of coping with the anxiety and pain associated with starting or completing an overwhelming or boring tasks. One of the reasons we procrastinate is that certain things are boring. All right, that's a fact. They're boring to us. Thankfully, doing income tax is not boring to about 2% of the population. <laughs> to whom we pay a lot of money to do it because uh, we don't want to do it, right? Uh, so luckily, there are people who will do those kinds of tasks, right? And also help us get organized, right? Uh, I'm going to skip through this real fast, but uh, the warning signs of procrastination, things that could lead to procrastination, is you have a long list of obligations. You speak to yourself, and I have to do this, I should be doing this, right? I need to. None of those statements, have to, should, need to, tell your mind and body when to start or what to do. And they just create obligation and resentment. You're vague about your goals, your vision, and values. We need to have a clear, I just use the word need. Oh. <laughs> it's useful. It's beneficial. It's optimal to have a clear executive brain vision about where you want to go. If you're driving down the freeway, it's good to stay in your lane even when a truck comes by on the left side and a truck comes on the right side. You want to stay in your lane and know where you're going. It's useful to know your direction in life. And if you don't know your direction, someone else will tell you theirs, right? What you'll do for them. All right. Um, if you're afraid of making a mistake, then your worth is not safe. I'm afraid I will be judged. My worth is contingent upon the opinion of others. Uh, how I feel this evening will be dependent upon uh, the degree to which you approve or disapprove of this presentation. Now, that would make me very nervous. But luckily, <laughs> while I would love applause and approval, uh, I don't need it. My worth is safe with me. And that's a contract I started with myself a long time ago. Okay. Uh, if you're waiting to feel confident, excuse me, this is a new button for me. What happened? That was for us. You're, you're waiting to feel confident, motivated, and to know everything. You're indecisive. 
So this is a concept when at UC Berkeley working with doctoral students and they would say, I'm not motivated. I lack confidence in writing my doctoral dissertation. I would say, what? I'm sorry, I don't understand. You see, my family didn't have much money and I started working at the age of 10 and I worked throughout high school 15 hours a week, high school and college 15 and 20 hours a week, graduate school at least 15 hours a week. So I was always showing up. I wasn't waiting to feel motivated. I wasn't waiting to feel confident. I don't understand that concept, right? It's a decision. It's a choice to show up. So I would say to those students, do you see the construction workers outside? Do you think they're waiting on a Monday morning at 5 or 6 a.m. to feel motivated before they go to work? <laughs> waiting to feel confident? We don't have time for you to have your ego feel confident and motivated. We need you to get started. When will you start? What can I do now? Five magical words. What can I do now to get a fear inoculation shot to make it easier for myself tomorrow? All right. So this is a somewhat revolutionary concept <laughs> because we hear lack of motivation. I lack motivation. I lack confidence. It's kind of normal talk, isn't it? But we want to disrupt our default way of thinking because that's archaic, it's outdated, and it doesn't fit your current intelligence and your current opportunities and challenges of today. Make sense? All right, so now we're moving on to solutions. So, and, th and this is based on my work with court reporters who must type 200 symbols a minute in order to pass the licensing exam, so they must be completely focused, all right. It's based on my work with athletes and musicians. Three qualities. This is, this is my theory, based on a lot of experience. This also is useful for preparing for surgery. Safety. There's no internal stress. You have a solid sense of worth with you. Your worth is safe with me, is your message. On my website, neilfiore.com, you will find regardless statements, regardless of what happens, your worth is safe with me. Even if, yes but, even if they say this, even if, yeah, I guess so, that would be tough, but yes, your worth is still safe with me. Think of it as holding a crying infant or an upset child or a sick child over your heart and saying, yes, I accept you even though you're human. I'm accepting you as human. This is part of life. And this self-acceptance creates a solid sense of worth and you are safe then, and you, that shuts off stress hormones. Safety shuts off stress hormones, right? So, and pardon this example, but if there were an earthquake now and you have healthy adrenals, you would, what would happen? If... <laughs> Some of you would run, some of you would scream, but we would all, in a split second, tighten our muscles and hold our breath, all right? As we are preparing for a survival response, sometimes called a stress response, but it is a survival response that is rushing the blood away from your hands, towards your heart, towards your brain. It is improving your immune system at that moment, and it is getting you ready for fight or flight, hmm? if you need it. But if the building and the lights don't fall down in the first one to two seconds, you shift from reptilian fight flight brain to guessing the Richter scale. And when you're guessing the Richter scale, you're moving to your prefrontal cortex, your human brain, and you're making a decision. It's not a 10, it's not an eight, it's not a six, Maybe it's a 2.5 located in San Jose. <sighs> and within 10 seconds, you exhale. And when you exhale, what you're saying to your mind and body is, I, the human brain who knows the Richter scale, who's been in California for a while, 
I take responsibility for saying it's safe to stop the adrenaline, it is safe to sit still, it's safe to exhale. It's safe to continue with this work, right? That's brilliant, and you've all done it. That you, from your newest brain on the planet, the prefrontal cortex human executive function is what they call it, the executive function, it has all the qualities of a leader, you are choosing to let go of the adrenaline response from the oldest brain on the planet, the reptilian alligator brain, the fight-flight brain, the survival response, and say, I don't need that today, thank you very much. <sighs> Might need it tomorrow. But within 10 to 30 seconds, you've completely shut off the stress hormones with a message of safety. And the easiest way to communicate that is to exhale. And when you exhale, you shift from sympathetic nervous system to parasympathetic, peaceful nervous system response. So it's useful to exhale. I know in California we talk about breathing and take a breath. But the most important part of it from my point of view is the exhalation. And when you exhale, it's useful to release muscle tension and float down into the chair. Because then your mind is with your body. And that's the rest of this. So choice, it's a third point of view. There's no inner conflict, but a third place. Choice is a third place, all right? That's gonna be on the exam. And presence. No past or future, what can I do now? The five magical words. That's gonna be on the exam as well, okay. And then don't you love people who just play with the PowerPoint stuff? I, uh, all right, okay. So, where is your safety net? Now, we live in a culture that was founded by the Puritans. And they brought us a concept that your worth as an individual is determined not only in this life but the next by your net worth at the bank and your, what you accomplish. Now, that concept is bought into by people, by children, who don't have the ability to think about that. But when you buy into that concept and that equation, then your, the judgment of your work is a judgment of your worth. And that makes it extremely difficult. If, for example, I were to say to you, this is my worth. Please let me know how I should feel this afternoon. I can't give it to you because it's my worth. I'm going to procrastinate on it. Or if I give it to you, I'll say, this is not my best work or worth. I procrastinated, did it at the last minute. And I have an excuse. So they feed in together that way. And we want to know that buying into that equation adds to or leads to procrastination for a lot of people. In fact, if I needed to pick one particular quality that helps people overcome procrastination, I would say inner worth, self-worth, the regardless statements on my website, neilfiore.com. Right. Also a breathing centering exercise there as well. If in fact you have a safety net for your worth, then you can hand in your work, and you accept yourself, and you are free from judgment. You have increased productivity. So let me give you an example of that. Let's imagine that you are walking a tightrope or a board. The board is from the back of the room to the front of the room. It's about 30 feet. It's one foot wide, four inches thick. You have all of the physical mental ability to do it. Can you walk the board or do the job? Let me hear, yes. Yes, yes. yes, I can do it, yes. It's easy, I can do it. Scene two, your ability is the same, the task is the same, only now the board is 100 feet off the ground, suspended between two apartment buildings. Can you do it now? No. Now what's changed? Fear of heights. Fear of heights, and what's the consequence? Possible death, if you make a mistake, if you slip, you would probably die, 
correct? So now you're on the board. Now we've seen you walk the board when it's on the ground. So we're looking at you and saying, why are you procrastinating? Just do it. Come on, right? Your boss is saying, stop procrastinating. But for you, you're looking over the edge and going, oh God, there's a lot at stake for me, right? Scene three, the task is the same. Your ability is the same. You're standing on the board. You've been delaying or procrastinating for a while. But all of a sudden, you feel heat behind you. You hear crackling noise of a fire. The building holding your end of the board is on fire. What are you doing now? All right. So that's a crucial moment. How did you break free of being stuck in fear, worrying about a mistake? How did you do that? There's greater fear immediately behind you. Right. Or I work best under pressure. <laughs> All right. All right. So the funny thing here is you're the one who raises the board off the ground by saying this work, this exam, this relationship will determine my future, my worth as a person. And you're raising the board off the ground. You're making it more and more dangerous, more and more of your emotional eggs are in this basket. Hmm? All right, luckily there's another scene. You're up there and maybe it's 70 feet or 100 feet, it's, it could be dangerous to make a mistake. Only this time, as you look down over the edge, you see about three or four feet below the board is a strong net. Can you do it now? Yes. What's different? Now this is important for you to hear yourself say, what is it with the safety net that makes it different for you? We won't die. We won't die. <laughs> this will not be the end of the world. I will not beat you up, all right? This is your psychological safety net. This is your guarantee to you. Even if you slip, you could still slip. You could still make a mistake. We're not gonna die over this. This is what you give yourself as a psychological safety net. Yes? Will you do it? Will you give yourself a safety net that says regardless of what happens, I am not gonna beat you up, I will not abandon you. Very powerful to do that. So we wanna break that equation, in my opinion. But what do I know? All right, so this is the way this works psychodynamically that, as I said earlier, you split yourself into you have to versus I don't want to. And then you're stuck. Freud would say the have to voice is a super ego voice, a dictator voice. Some people call it the critical parent, but it's really not a parent in any event. Uh, and then an id voice. I call this the six-year-old fighting with the two-year-old. In fact, I actually had in my office at one time a six-year-old sister with a two-year-old and the two-year-old is climbing all over her mother and the six-year-old is a proper young lady and she's sitting very still and she turns to her little sister and says, stop acting like a baby. <laughs> and what do you think the two-year-old did? She acted like a baby. <laughs> and more like a baby, right? And what I realized in that moment was that six-year-old is talking to her own inner two-year-old. After all, it wasn't that long ago. And she's saying to herself, you know, you're six, you cannot act like a baby anymore, all right? Now, six-year-olds are obsessed with the rules. Why? Por qué? Why are they interested in the rules? All right, yes. They want to be big people. They want to, I would agree, they want to identify with big people and they want to know what the rules are so that they're not shamed and embarrassed in school. They're not shamed in society. They want to know the rules of society because they know that unconditional love, hold, cover his ears, would you please? That unconditional love is over. 
by the time you're 18 months. By the time you get to walk and run, it's over. Unconditional love, being in paradise is a very short period of time. And so many of us are still trying to get back there. Okay. So what I discovered at the age of 22 was that there's a third place. There is a self. There is a choice. I choose. You don't have to want to, and you don't have to. In fact, one way to get yourself moving and started is to say to yourself, you don't have to. But I have to. <laughs> because of the consequences, because of what? Well, you see, it's, the have to is a threat. Remember, we're slimming down your vocabulary. So you have to is a threat, or else what? I will make myself miserable. You can't get away from that person inside your head. So that's a tough one. So I discovered at the age of 22 that there's a third place, there's choice. All right. And I got there from, it's a long story, but in any event, I'm standing in an aeroplane and it's graduation day from airborne school, the Army's paratrooper school. And for three weeks, we are running around in Georgia and we are doing push-ups and sit-ups, five o'clock in the morning, running around the track holding a nine-pound rifle with running in combat boots. Terrible, excruciating boot camp, right? It's so painful that you forget that on graduation, they're gonna ask you to jump out of an airplane. <laughs> All right, so graduation day, and they take the plane up to 1,500 feet. They open the door, and they expect you to jump out, right? Now the plane's going 150 miles an hour, 1,500 feet, right? And now they train you to put your hands on the outside because, and bend your knees because you need to jump through a wind tunnel of 150 miles an hour, right? If you don't, it will pick you up and your body will slam against the outside of the plane and your chute could wrap around you, you could be unconscious, and probably like that 100-foot board, you would probably die. Right. So, with that in mind, <laughs> we're standing in the plane, and I'm the 12th person back, and I watch the first man get in the door. Now, the first man, unfortunately, has a few more seconds than the rest of us, because the plane is moving over the drop zone, and he puts his hands on the inside of the plane. Now, I'm really nervous. This is the highest level of stress I've ever had. And I, I know that's wrong. This guy's ambivalent. The next thing he does is extremely counterproductive. He looks down. <laughs> and from this awkward position, his body pulls back, right, from whatever he's looking at. And I don't even want to imagine what he's looking at. Trees, rocks, oh my God. Right, right. I'm back there, and what do you think I'm saying to myself? This is nuts. This is, nuts. This is crazy, right? So I was saying to myself, what I'm counseling you not to say to your children or yourself or your own brain, you have to. You have to jump. You have to do something that's completely crazy. And what do you think the other part is saying? Forget about it. There ain't no way you can get me to jump out of this plane. My other voice is from Jersey City, New Jersey. <laughs> so you have to. And the more I put on the pressure, the more the other part said, no, I'm not going. No, no. Right? And I was stuck. I was literally paralyzed. I could not move. I did not know how I was going to move until I saw that guy from this awkward position before the sergeant was about to kick him out. He forced himself, hear that word, he forced himself out, got picked up by the propolis, and sure enough, boom, his body slams against the side of the plane, okay? I learned I have to say to people, he was okay, he was black and blue, and unfortunately he had to repeat airborne training again, which is awful enough, but he did survive. And at that moment, he helped me make my first choice. I'm not gonna do it that way. 
Second choice, the sergeant's not going to have to kick me out. Third choice, I'm going to do everything to maximize my chances in a bad situation. And I very consciously put my hands on the outside as we trained. I bent my knees, I looked up at a cloud, and I cleared that plane by about 10 feet, I'm sure. It was an Olympic jump. <laughs> I cleared the plane, I got carried back, and I'm riding back, and that prop list hits your legs, and you're riding on this pillow of air, and you can see your boots, and everything's milky. And the plane that's going 150 miles an hour doesn't go like a train. It slowly moves like an apartment building, and you go, oh my God. I'm moving at 149 miles an hour. <laughs> and then four seconds later, as the chute begins to open and you hear the snapping of the elastic bands, whew, suddenly everything's quiet and the plane in fact does move and the earth opens up around you green and beautiful and you have your own personal cloud. I loved it. By the time I landed, I, I rolled without a scratch, right? Mother nature, God did not kill me. I laughed, I looked up, and I said to myself, there's a third place. There's choice. It's not just being stuck and paralyzed in a fight between you have to versus I don't want to. You see? So at the age of 22, I was lucky enough, <laughs> through circumstances somewhat beyond my control, and there he is, <laughs> innocent and naive and Notice the right hand is on the reserve chute D-ring. <laughs> Ready, in fact, if the main chute doesn't open. All right. So as we're beginning to wrap up, procrastinators say you have to. You have to finish. You have to get it done. Now, that's sufficient to cause procrastination because you have to immediately causes resistance and inner conflict with I don't want to. A super ego fighting in it. You split yourself. You have to finish something big and important. Do it perfectly. Why do I need to do it perfectly? Because my sense of worth is gonna be judged if you buy into that. I have to do it perfectly because I couldn't stand criticism. And you're going to suffer a lot of pain and deprivation. Your work is all about to-do lists and obligations. There is no fun for you, young lady, until you eat your Brussels sprouts and do your math homework. And to top it off, your worth as a person will be judged. Now, how motivating is that? You have to finish something big and important, do it perfectly, suffer with no fun while everyone else is out playing, and your worth will be judged. I guarantee if you are talking to yourself or a child in that language, that there will be procrastination. However, it is adequate to say you have to finish. So I started to replace those statements with the statements of producers. I choose, I am the one choosing. I, the prefrontal cortex human brain, have finally shown up to be responsible for my life, I apologize for not showing up earlier. You can say to the reptile brain and the monkey brain. I choose to start. <laughs> I choose to start. Finish is where? Goal is where? It's in the future. It doesn't exist. The workers can't get there. You must tell them when to start and where to start on one small step, uh, perhaps 15 minutes. When I say that to a procrastinator, what do you think a procrastinator says? That's not enough time. But you haven't done 15 minutes in, in six weeks. <laughs> it's not enough. So you want a short amount of time so that you can face, I had someone actually who had five years of back taxes. And I said to him, I don't know how you're going to do that. If I were you, I would move to Cuba. <laughs> but he did start 15 minutes a day, getting his fear inoculation shot, building momentum, getting some movement, 
And after a while, he went to a half an hour a day, and he actually finished five years of back taxes. I don't know how to do that. All right. um, you're going to do it humanly. You acknowledge that you are a human being. You understand that unconditional love is over, that you are not a god or a goddess or an angel. I'm a human being. Nothing will be perfect that I do. Right? I accept myself. This is going to be a rough, rough draft. Right. Anyway, that's, a, that's one way to do things more quickly is to make it a rough draft. Then you can edit it later. And I have lots of guilt-free play in my schedule. Now, when I was running the groups at UC Berkeley, I divided the group into those who completed their doctoral dissertation in under two years and those who took three to 13 years. Those of us who completed the doctoral dissertation under two years had part-time jobs. I had a full-time job, had exercise programs, had friends, social obligations, which meant we were busy with other things and we had deadlines, immediate deadlines this afternoon. I'm gonna meet friends for lunch at two. So I better get started working at 7.30 or eight. I've got things to do. I'm gonna meet with, with friends or I have a class at six. So I better start earlier. Does that make sense? You know that old thing? If you want to get something done, you give it to a busy person. All right. So, guilt-free play. If you have play scheduled in your schedule, then it's legitimate. All right. If your play begins to feel guilty, it means you're avoiding something and you need to do 15 or 30 minutes of work so that you improve the sense of enjoyment of your play. If you're watching television and you know you're avoiding something, in fact, I would say, if you are vacuuming or you are scrubbing the grout out of the shower with a toothbrush, probably means you are avoiding something that's even more noxious to you than scrubbing the grout. And of course, a key psychological ingredient, one of the ones that's the most complex here, but also uh, one of the ones that is the most important is giving your sense self a sense of worth. If your worth is safe, it's much easier to hand in your work and you're able to deal with criticism. And you, I, you know, I have six published books, lots of criticism and strange remarks from editors. So, anyway. <laughs> so, and then uh, this is no news to you all, but our time is limited. We only have a certain amount of energy we have a limited amount of resources. You can't do it all. You must choose what to let go of. Now, this is one of the issues of being a human being. Carl Jung said, the gods can have it all. The gods can do it all, but human beings must choose. Human beings have the ability to choose. Gurdjieff said, the animal brain has a fear and reacts. It has a want and reacts. The enlightened or human brain has the same fear, the same wants, but chooses how to act in a way that is consistent with his or her goals and values. Humans, the defining act is that choice, choosing to act in alignment with values. Does that make sense? So you are actually acting more like a true human being when you use your higher brain. Uh, Jack Lugman had quadruple bypass surgery. He's driving down the LA freeway and he's cut off by a red sports car. And his friend says, because he knows Jack's temper, says, wow, Jack, that was cool. You didn't even beep the horn. And Jack very calmly says, after quadruple bypass surgery, you know when to beep the horn and when not to beep the horn. <laughs> you conserve your energy. Uh, priorities come into being productive or overcoming procrastination. Again, you can't do it all. You know, triage, one third of the supply of morphine and blood supply is gonna go to those troops who are the most viable. One third may not make it. And if we have more, we go to the middle third 
that on our next slide to the right. Uh, do you know the 80 20 rule? So they teach that in business school, but Pareto was an Italian sociologist and he found that 20% of his plants produced 80% of the crops. He went to an insurance company and he found in the files that 20% of the clients brought in 80% of the money. You can't do it all on any given day and with limited amount of time, you want to find the most valuable 20%, right? The number of ways of saying that, do it, delegate it or dump it, right? Throw it out, right? I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna move ahead because of our time. And then there's a wonderful statement from Goethe. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. All right. In German, it doesn't rhyme, apparently. <laughs> How much time do we have, by the way? Until 1.30. Oh. 10 minutes. <coughs> All right. So here, here is the unschedule. And uh, my books, when they went to England, it cost a lot of money because they had to change the word schedule to schedule. It was very costly. So the point being here that there are 168 hours in a week. Seven times 24 is 168. That's a blank, un or a blank schedule. And you can find that again on my website, neilfiore.com. Do I need to spell it? N-E-I-L-F-I-O-R-E, -E, neilfiore.com, and it does have blank schedules, which are useful to print out. And then what I'm trying to indicate here is that you fill in your sleep time first, you fill in your hike time on Sunday, you fill in your dinner time, your commute time, and, and then the rest of the time is open and you only fill it in secondarily as billable hours or billable minutes as they do in law or architecture, right? So if, for example, you're having a more typical work day, first you fill in all of your other time commitments so psychologically you begin to see your life is not all about work. And then secondly, you use it as a time clock and you punch in at, let's say, oh, 10.45, and you work for 0.75 or 45 minutes, and then you work for an hour, and you take credit for it, and you will discover, as I have, that approximately 15 to 20 hours a week is enough to write a book in a year. 15 hours a week. Now, the, the take home here is it's not 100 hours a week, it's not 60, it's not 40, 15 to 20 hours a week is enough to write a doctoral dissertation in a year. It's enough to write a book in a year. That's quality, focused time with plenty of guilt-free play and commitment to your sleep, your lunch, your meetings, and every, your exercise and everything else, right? So the subtitle of the now habit is Overcoming Procrastination While Enjoying Guilt-Free Play. Because right, that became the key ingredient that distinguished between those who took less than two years and those who took three to 13 years to do their doctoral dissertation. All right. Do you want to do an exercise around this? Yeah. Are you open? Oh, yeah? All right. So this does involve closing your eyes. And I am a licensed psychologist in California. I am required to actually do an eye-closed exercise every time <laughs> by law. So if you will close your eyes and if you will go to the theater of your mind and imagine you're in a comfortable seat, but you're thinking about starting on that project that you would like to start on or told yourself you should start on or have to start on, and you're thinking about it, and as you think about it, this is a mental rehearsal, so you want to notice what happens in your body as you think about starting on this project. Notice what happens in your emotions, your thoughts. Notice how you attempt to motivate yourself or instruct yourself. And most importantly, notice that there's a part of you calmly noticing. And that part instructs you now to take a deep breath 
hold it, pull in your stomach, tighten your toes, your biceps, and then three, two, exhale completely, releasing your muscles and floating down into the chair, into the floor at night, into the bed. Once again, three parts. Part one, inhale. Two, tighten, pull in your stomach, tighten your biceps, curl your toes, and exhale away thoughts about the past. Exhale away old ideas about who you were in the past. Take a vacation from old problems in the past. Once again, three parts, inhale. Hold and tighten, pull in your stomach, tighten your biceps, your fists, and three, Exhale and release, training your muscles to release whenever you consciously exhale. Float down into the chair, feel the chair backing you up and holding you. Once again, three parts, inhale, hold, tighten, exhale and float down into the current moment. Having brought your mind in from the past, in from the so-called future, choose to be where you are now, Graciously accept the support of the chair and nature outside holding you. Graciously accept the support of nature inside you, taking care of you, knowing how to make over five million healthy new red blood cells every minute, a whole new lining to your esophagus every week, a whole new layer of skin every 28 days. Really taking care of you, a gift from yourself, to yourself, for yourself. Really appreciate this moment, the only time there is, and experience the feeling of the chair backing you up, representing nature outside, holding you, supporting you, so that you as a consciousness, as a conscious identity, are not alone. You are connected to a larger system of support inside and outside. And then in three to five breaths, you might consider taking five steps up the side of a hill for a better, different view of things, counting up, normal breathing. One, five breaths, five steps. Two, curious and interested about what you will see from the top of that hill, a new view of things, a new perspective. Three, coming up, adequately alert, first from the neck up. Four, feeling better than before. Getting ready to open your eyes, eager to begin appreciating the cooperation of your mind and body, getting ready to start at five. Curious about how much you'll accomplish in a time that normally would seem so short. All right. Did I put you all to sleep? Yeah? So what did you experience doing that? Peace, quiet, yeah. So, it seems simple, but remember that you are activating the three qualities for peak performance. Safety, you're shutting off the stress hormones. You're saying, it is safe to be here with me in front of this project. You're choosing, I am choosing to be here. It is safe to be here. And you are present in this moment, the only moment there is, so that you can start now. Very good. And then this is a, an outline of it, one to three breaths actually, but in less than a minute. If you do three to 12 breaths before you start major projects, before you transition from one project to another, I do this, I take at least three breaths before I put my car in gear, for example. I want to know where I am. I want to know what's around me. I don't want to be rushing to get into the future. I don't want to be worrying about the past, some, some past upset. I'm here now, and this is what I'm doing. So you are transitioning to this moment. And then you'll get excited and nervous, and then you'll transition to the next moment. And I think of it as going from one sanctuary and safe, quiet place, and then you run out into a rainstorm or, or snow blizzard, and then you rush to another nice warm place and you center in a sanctuary where it is safe to think, it's safe to be with you, it's safe to be creative, all right? Now, when you asked a four-year-old, how did you do that? How did you draw that picture, like a Picasso? You ask a four-year-old, how did you put all those toys together? What does she say? 
I don't know. It was easy. It just comes to me. So that four-year-old self does not have the brain split, does not have the ego split apart, is still integrated and is in the moment and has the positive expectancy that when I show up, my inner playmate, my inner genius is there. Let's get back to that time, right? So we show up with, I don't know, I don't have to know, do I? I show up and it comes to me. It's easy. Then you're using more of your genius brain. Thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it. We may have a minute or two for one or two questions, maybe. Okay. There is a lot of information and free articles on my website, neilfiore.com. Uh, yes. So a question about something I've never heard about, uh, the enteric nervous system. No, I have not heard about that. It's the gut, you know, and it's just like it's part of the, when you have a stress reaction, you clamp down, you know, and it's like your gut has its own mind sort of type. Uh, well, there are people, of course, who talk about their gut and their gut reaction, and it's extremely useful to write out and express your thoughts or to sing the blues, for example, to get it out of your gut, process it through your higher human brain into words and get it outside. Very, very powerful in building your immune system. And those people who write 15 minutes a day about stressful issues or, or things that trouble them uh, have fewer illnesses and their immune system is operating better. Their cortisol stress hormones are lower. So thank you. Yes, one more. Um, one of my issues are papers. And I like to collect resources of things. But I'm afraid to file them because I'm afraid I'll never find them again. Yes. <laughs> so that slows me down. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can give you the name of someone who can help you with that. <laughs> but Because um, I have the same problem, so I can't help you. <laughs> but... Uh, no, there's someone who stands over you and says, can you find that in the library? Can you find that on the internet? And you're like, oh, okay. could you really find it in all this stuff, like that, that box that you talked about earlier with, where your passport's in it? Uh, you know, so uh, it, it is a certain discipline, and I dislike that word, but it is a certain willpower that says, I'm gonna let go of it, right? That I will not beat myself up in the future if I can't find it. Now, that's important. That's your contract with yourself. So when you have a contract with yourself that regardless of what happens, those regardless statements are on the website, regardless of what happens, your worth is safe with me. And then it'll say, yes, but even if this happens, and you'll go, oh, not that. Oh, well. And then you think about it and go, yeah, this is the plan. This is how we'll do it. Even if that happens, I will accept myself as a human being. I accept you as a human being. I'm on your side. Isn't that nice? You have a psychological safety net. Thank you so much. <laughs>